of our peers to gather. I'm just going to do a quick check. I think everybody is set. Uh, Astrid Leiden, as well as Susan Wettenkamp Brandt, are both available to assist with any tech issues. So just chat any questions or needs you have in the task bar. Uh, we are muting all of you from our end. And then those of you with roles will just unmute you when it's your turn and you just want to make sure that you are unmuted at your end. And throughout the webinar, uh, just uh, feel free to pose any questions or comments in the chat box as we go. Uh, there are occasional points at which we'll stop and Astrid will help us um, pay attention to some of the comments and pose some of the questions to our presenters. And cohort participants, I'm encouraging you to have at hand your assignment 8A uh, note pages. Um, we'll be asking just a little bit about your key takeaways from that assignment. And it might also be helpful when you go into your breakout uh, small group discussion today. In addition, both posted in webinar materials and in Schoology, is a note taking sheet for today if that's something that's helpful for you to um, sort of for me it helps me pay attention <laughs> and um, organize my notes instead of sort of all over my page so that's another tool available for you um, have that at hand if you would like and we are going to get started All right. Thanks, Liz. And a special thank you to Liz Andres, our uh, consultant for Adult Career Pathways at Atlas, for putting this webinar together and her work all year long with this cohort. Uh, I'm Patsy Egan. I direct the Atlas, the AB Teaching and Learning Advancement System, housed at Hamlin. And I want to welcome all of you and our employer education and workforce partners who are joining us today. We have several special guests who will be joining us, so I, I appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. As you know, this is part of a year-long um, Adult Career Pathways Professional Development Initiative. We began back last August at Summer Institute by kicking off face-to-face uh, -face workshops, and then we've been in contact all year long, both in coaching calls and webinars, and um, working through this complex stuff and working to uh, improve our Adult Career Pathways and ABE statewide. So thank you for being a part of it. I'm just going to take us through the objectives for today's webinar and the agenda, and then I'll hand it back over to Liz. So after today's time, you should be able to connect with employers on your local workforce development boards and CTE advisory committees for engaging with ACT programs. Also, um, you'll be able to explain to a, um, an employer's perspective on engaging with design and delivery of an ACP program. So, of course, today's work is especially focused on employer engagement. And also um, be able to define opportunities with your current adult career pathway for strengthening or perhaps expanding employer engagement in your context. To get this done, our agenda today is to, first of all, we're going to set the stage. Um, if you want to go ahead and there it is, setting the stage for some context and perspective so that it's clear how and why we're getting this work done. Um, we'll be hearing some key takeaways from engaging employers through that online links course from uh, one of your peers, Amy. And then we'll move along and hear from employers on local development development boards, local, I'm sorry, local workforce development boards. And then we'll also be hearing from employers on career technical ed advisory committees. And uh, the, that perspective, that employer perspective is particularly important and we'll hear about collaborating between business and education partnerships uh, in pathway programs. And finally, we'll have an opportunity for some small group discussion and some reporting back, of course, at the end. And that small group discussion will give you more information, but we're using a new feature through GoToTraining today to um, make it possible for you to talk in small groups right here on the webinar. So that's our plan for this, uh, this afternoon. Thanks so much for joining us. A lot to get done, so we'll turn it over to Liz Andres. Go ahead, Liz. Thank you so much. Ah, so just a little bit of context and perspective, setting the stage for our conversation today. One of the really helpful tools that you will be um, utilizing in your upcoming assignment 8B around engaging employers and how we make that all happen is uh, I really uh, find helpful a couple of um, graphics in that toolkit. This one is an array of possible roles that em employers can take in an adult career pathway. 
So I think for me, this just really helps expand and start thinking creatively um, about how we invite in and partner with employers. I'm not gonna read through all of these, but um, we know that the employer is important in just figuring out what it is and telling us, informing us what's needed uh, in the job in terms of those foundational and technical skills, all the way to being ready to interview completers of an adult career pathway program. Another way to think about those roles is in sort of um, increasing levels of engagement that employers can take in adult career pathway partnerships. I think this really helps in just thinking step by step. So level one is really just showing up and um, advising us on what we're doing. That's that sort of level of initial contact, it's a new relationship, and that is the appropriate way to start with most employers. Some will start at level two, um, and then the goal really is over time and as trust develops, that employer engagement uh, has the potential of really um, moving to higher levels of co-convening, co-designing, and co-leadership of the whole initiative. The way I think about this work for the cohort this year is really very similar to um, what we've done in uh, the other focus areas of enrollment and around for workforce partners. It's really looking at where are you now, what are your goals, where and how can you connect with employers who have a stake in adult career pathway programming? What tools are available to guide your work with employers? How do you move forward? And so have all of these questions in mind as you listen today, and then this really is the work in assignment 8B. And I also encourage you today to consider all of your adult career pathway programming uh, all of the programs that you have going on right now and what you might have going in the future. So for example, we'll have a portion today around um, adult career pathways that include a community and technical college partner. Well, maybe your focus ACP for this cohort doesn't include that partner, but you really want this information because almost certainly you will have um, a career and technical education partner in the future. So again, um, you get to take all of this and apply it to your own context. Because <laughs> as I am reminded every week of this cohort work, your contexts vary so much. And it really made it challenging to think about, well, how do we do each of these portions, especially this webinar? We recognize that small town is different than medium-sized city, is different than metro area. When you think about the number of employers, the size of employers, um, and the size of the employer itself really matters. In the smallest employer um, business, they might have a hard time even having anybody to deploy to come to a planning meeting with you. And then a large employer, you really need to figure out how to navigate that structure when are you talking to human resources? When are you talking to operations? When do you need to tap high level management? And then really with employers, each sector is also going to vary. Um, relating to employers in the trades is going to be different than healthcare. Education and business are also going to have their own cultures, their own language, their own uh, employment gaps. So. Um, once again, the challenge is to take what you learn through the cohort and fit it into your own context, and then to really be sharing that out um, with the cohort, uh, with your peers, um, so that we're all learning from each other. I just had a few takeaways before we move on to a couple of your peers. Um, the first is, it really is important conceptually and in practice to understand that employers engage in adult career pathways for their benefit. 
not in a selfish way, but it's important to understand that when we're approaching employers, we are not asking them to help. We are asking them to partner for mutual benefit. They have employment gaps. There are people in the community who could be filling those employment gaps. Adult basic education and our adult career pathway partners are essential to helping them meet those needs. Many of our employer partners want to diversify their workforce. We are the partner to make that happen. We're hearing that just this week from Hennepin County. So as you shape messages to uh, reach out to employers, really be thinking about how an adult career pathway program can benefit those employer partners. Uh, Karen Walters shared this with me, and this is really helpful, and I wanted to share it with the group. She said, you know, it's really important to understand that employers are not a system. Education is a system. Uh, ABE is a system. Minnesota State is a system. But employers really are not a system. So to recognize that when we have an employer involved with an adult career pathway, each particular employer has unique needs and perspectives. And even within the same sector, clinic needs are different than hospital employer needs that might differ from long-term care facilities. So be careful about thinking that you might have an employer rep and really get the employers around the table that you need involved. And finally, and probably the other thing that made this, um, this whole segment on employer engagement really challenging to design is that while we want to equip you as ABE managers to do employer outreach yourself, you cannot do this work solo and have good results. Um, and so it's one of those places that really makes us realize that collaboration with other partners, our workforce partners, other educators, is just essential so that we can share the work of employer engagement. This also led me to think about, well, where are employers already showing up? Um, and so that has uh, shaped a portion of the webinar today that will come up in a few minutes, thinking about collaboration with our partners. One of the things that I wanted um, to do today was to hear from some of you and bring in what we learned from Assignment 8A, which was this two-hour online course on Adult Career Pathway Basics. Realized we didn't need to do that in our own webinar. It existed online. Um, I went through the course, found it uh, extremely useful, provided you a tool for sort of um, calling key points uh, from the webinar. So we've invited um, Amy Dinkle van Valkenburg and another cohort participant each to share a takeaway and sort of how that is relevant in their uh, adult career pathway work in their locality. I am going to um, invite Amy uh, once I get you unmuted here. Welcome, Amy. Amy, we're not hearing you, so make sure that you are unmuted at your end. There, can you hear me? Thank you, Amy. Yep. Hey, everybody. Amy is, the, good. Amy is the program manager of Central Minnesota North Freshwater ABE. And go ahead, Amy. Okay. Yeah, I thought the online course through links was great. Um, it was really helpful. It was some review, which actually was good since I am very new and just starting to work on an adult career pathway with um the medical fields, but I'm not even close to that. We've been working on the Long Prairie Packing Plant, starting a citizenship, English for citizenship course there. So that's actually what's been giving me some pre-experience to starting an actual adult career pathway program, as well as this course. And I think for me, two main things, um, get to know someone in HR of the company with which you're working and the way that I started to do that with the Long Prairie Packing Plant was I started to intentionally invite 
the uh, contacts in HR at the packing plant to events that I thought that they would be interested in or their employees would be interested in. For instance, I did a PCs for People event well, almost two years ago now, and that's actually an event that uh, the HR uh, manager ended up attending and helping with, and that started that relationship. So you never know, like necessarily which which thing it is going to interest them, but just if you have many things going on and you intentionally invite um, them to the events, you're probably going to find something that they're going to that's going to pique their interest. And like, yeah, I really would like my um, employees to have access to um, affordable internet and affordable computers. And so that's what sparked my relationship there, and it just began to grow to grow from there. Um, and then I also had a ACP interest class. It was three sessions and I intentionally, I very intentionally sent out invitations to local employer HR um, departments of local employers. And I had five or six actually send people to my adult career pathway interest class that I hosted here in my classroom, sort of outside of ABE, just as interest. And I invited my own students along with anybody from the community and those employers together. And they got to speak about what they, um, what their companies um, did and what you needed in order to be able to be qualified to work at their company that needed to be and what kind of education that you needed. So that also helped initiate some of those relationships with um, individuals and human resources departments in the local um, employers in the local area. So that was one big takeaway too from the links class that just did with what I was doing, what I kind of knew to be true, but was really affirming in that class. And then the other part was um, plan ahead and create a meeting schedule. I see you have a slide there that kind of has these um, bulleted, but specifically what did I do to plan ahead and what did I, who did I work with and um, who did I connect with? So I just started to look around my area, who is, who else is doing programming out here that might be similar to my kind of programming? Where are my connections? Where am I, what agencies am I overlapping with? And I found out that actually the U of M extension programming was somewhat overlapping and they were interested in working with me the great river regional library system and um, then there was also a local committee in town called the wellness coalition that was through centric care health and that's actually one of my big connections for building on this acp career pathway in healthcare careers so those are some specific examples um, of what i've been doing in order to build on the acp develop developing an ACP program in our local area. Thank you, Amy. You'd also had this note about the importance of an ABE partner mentor. Yes. And I and appreciated that as well. Just you're sort of talking about what we're doing in terms of support and accountability within the cohort. Yes, it's so important. I think um, for me having Stephanie Drange from the Wadena Adult Basic Ed and Jessica Turner from the the sister campus to my campus. Um, she's in Brainerd, and I'm in Staples. And then uh, Meg from Sock Rapids. I think having those mentors has really been just so critical and so vital when you're trying to understand and build adult career po programming. You have to have mentors that are helping you learn with each step that you go that you can rely on and ask questions to and how did you do that and how did you get there? Who was your connection or how do you even make a meeting or? <laughs> yeah. It's just so critical. Mm -hmm. Good, so I'm glad that that's proving really um, It's so important. Valuable to you, yeah. Thank you for that quick, just sort of, this is what I came away with. Uh, we've also invited Emily Watts, ABE Program Coordinator from Osseo Area Schools. Uh, Emily. Oh, sorry. I have to unmute you. I apologize. 
That's okay. Thanks so much for having me here. So I um, want to just echo what Amy had to say and say that I did find the webinar to be really useful. And the thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about that I found most resonant was this idea of building connections to employers based on their needs, but also finding ways then to leverage them or match them up to our strengths as programs. Um, so I think what Karen says is really true that when you're talking to individual employers, they're all individual. And so you might need to tailor your conversation or your message to each one of them a little bit differently. So one of the things that was a key takeaway for me was sort of coming up with this idea of uh, what kind of questions do you want to ask? And so um, sort of having that bank of questions that I want to take with me. So that idea of like, when I talk to ABE partners about one, understanding um, what the language and the issues that resonate are, is I ask my ABE partners, what was your aha moment in developing a successful partnership or building a successful partnership? I also like to ask people about what the talking points were that they used to get their conversation started. And what does partnership mean to them? And that last question, I also like to ask of my employers, because I want to understand that we have a shared vocabulary and that we have a shared sense of like kind of like where we are starting from, where we think we might be going. It doesn't have to be that we're exactly on the same page, but one of the aha moments for me in this process has really been about not having that shared understanding or that shared um, sort of sense of where we're at and that could be just because of a word definition it be, could be because when we talk about low level learners and abe that's not necessarily what our local employers are talking about or what deed is talking about and so having that that common language to get started can be really helpful one of the other pieces that i find is really helpful is under in the whole idea of understanding what's important to employers is that oftentimes we find that there's that barrier about what skills do you need people to be able to do so we try not to talk as much about like do people have to have a high school credential and we try i try to help reframe that conversation with local employers about what are the skills that they need and is that something that we could help provide a service for uh, without necessarily having a GED or a high school diploma to be able to be um, either a screening piece or, or a, a stumbling block for people. And what does that mean for our local employer? And are they willing to make some um, accommodations or to, to change anything at, in uh, relation to that? The other piece that I really like to ask is, how do you see training or education fitting into your organization? So when I try to figure out what's important to my employers, I try to ask them about where they see education possibly fitting into their organization, and then also understanding what their biggest pressure points are right now. So all of those pieces sort of tie together to keep that conversation moving forward so that we can figure out whether or not we're going to be a good fit to be able to move a partnership or a collaboration forward. But I mean, like we hear over and over again is that, you know, you, you just can't give up. You have to be persistent, that situations change, staffing changes, programs change, um, you know, individual needs change. And so even if you've tried employers um, once or twice before, it's always worth um, trying again because you just you always want to be open maybe to what the potentials are. Um, I've had that happen actually twice in the past month now where we've had large scale employers. Um, and community-based organizations that I haven't had a lot of success working with, um, both approach me for the first time ever um, and say, hey, we're interested in working with you. Hey, we're interested in learning more about what AB, ABE has to offer. And so um, being willing to continue that conversation in light of maybe past failure is something that um, you just really can't or I can't um, really overestimate as something that you need to do in this process. Wow, thank you, Emily. I hope um, Emily gets a chance in her small group to share about a little bit of Hennepin County is one of the big employers that's just uh, come our way. And Emily is uh, leading that conversation with Hennepin County. They need us, they know that, and uh, that's pretty exciting. So thank you again, Amy and Emily. Um, and anybody else want to just chat one key takeaway um, for you from that um, work that you did on the online course? 
it's possible to just sort of crank through that because it's an assignment, but there, it really was quite rich in um, uh, input to our work. So if uh, we just have maybe a minute for people to uh, chat in a couple of thoughts uh, or really anything uh, response to Amy or Emily. See that Teresa says the idea of working with the college uh, and hired with their existing employer groups. Good, we'll be talking more about that in just a moment. We'll move on at this point, and if there are other things you wanna share, you can do that in your small group in just a little while. And I just have a note here that um, another way to share out some of your thinking is in a new uh, posted Schoology discussion. It's called discussion number eight in the Schoology folder. Um, share your takeaways from the online course, how you're applying them locally in your adult career pathway endeavors, any questions you wanna to pose to your peers. That uh, Schoology discussion forum really can be a useful way to interact with one another. Um, there is another uh, comment here. Uh, I think we'll come back to that one just so we can move on right now from Scott. Thank you, Scott. We've invited Ann Kilzer back. You've met her before at our face-to-face -face and in our previous webinar. I've asked Ann, had some conversation with her about um, the local workforce development boards and specifically the employers who show up on those boards. So here again is one of those, we don't need to cold call, we don't need to do this on our own. Employers have stepped up and are already engaged in workforce development. And I've asked Ann just to um, spend a few minutes helping us understand um, employers on the LWDBs and how we can connect with them. Thank you, Ann. I'll unmute you here. All right, am I unmuted? You are, thank you so much. Awesome, okay. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me back again. So just as a reminder, there's 16 workforce development boards across the state and those boards um, are appointed by local elected officials and at least 51% of the boards have to be representatives of private industry. And so those boards are really a connector between the programs and the funding um, to the community. Um, in addition to employers, there are representatives of adult basic education, as you know, as well as community-based organizations, higher ed, K-12, labor, um, economic development. So it's really a table where a lot of these discussions are happening. Um, so as Liz had mentioned, you know, rather than cold calling or kind of starting from scratch as to putting together an employer list, um, one place that you could look is to your local workforce development board because those are people who are already kind of engaged with the system. Um, so um, attending a workforce development board meeting in person, um, speaking with your adult basic education representative and asking if you can come along or finding out from them when the meetings are occurring and just kind of seeing the lay of the land at a workforce board meeting um, is one way to do that. Um, and just seeing the types of conversations they're having and what they're working on. Um, the leadership could also, um, working with your local directors and finding out what kind of committee structure the boards have and if there are ways to engage. Um, all the boards do have an AB representative, but most boards have committees or subcommittees that are working on specific um, issues or initiatives as well and welcome representatives that go beyond their actual board member. So that's another way that you can get engaged. Um, I know suggesting that going to another meeting in our busy lives um, can be a challenge as well, but um, it's a place where those discussions are happening. Um, and their folks, the representatives of the employer representatives on the local workforce development boards could be helpful to you just in that they are representing industries that are in high demand in your area. So they should be familiar kind of with the landscape. Um, there are people who are used to and have volunteered to kind of be the voice of employers. Um, they're familiar with the workforce system. They're familiar with kind of the landscape and they're used to talking about these things. Um, so rather than connecting with an employer um, at first who might not be familiar with types, what types of um, programs or funding or opportunities there might be in working with public systems, these are folks who are already familiar with that. 
Um, so one thing that I had mentioned to Liz would be an idea for folks to kind of get your feet wet is to actually do informational interviews with some of those employers who sit on the local boards um, and getting to some of those things that Emily was just mentioning about, like what does resonate with them? How do they think, you know, do they have any pointers of how you could approach businesses or the types of language that is important, what resonates with them? They could be a bit of a sounding board for you in that respect. Um, so some of the other things that we've heard, um, just in working with employers, and as you may or may not be aware, there are folks in the workforce centers who go out and talk to employers. Um, there are folks from DEED and the economic development side who are talking to employers. Chambers are talking to employers. Higher Ed is talking to employers. K-12 is talking to employers. And so one thing that we've heard is that um, employers get kind of fatigued, like all oh, these people are asking me what I need, and I tell them, and then nothing happens. So um, to the extent that you can align with teams of people from your area who may be talking to employers um, and trying to do visits together, I think is one thing that can help. I think framing it in a way, and this was mentioned before, not so much what do you need, but here's what we can offer you and helping them think about what they need. Maybe they don't even know um, what you can offer or what it is that they might need, but putting it into that type of language um, I think is helpful. Um, some of the challenges that employers have too is um, a lot of times, especially with smaller employers, they actually don't know, like if you ask them, what do you think you know, your hiring needs are gonna be in six months or a year from now so that we can put together a program to address that? They might not know. Sometimes smaller employers don't know, particularly in like manufacturing and those types of um, things where it can vary so much based on the economy. They might not know three weeks from now what their hiring needs are gonna be, much less you know, a while down the road. Um, so being mindful of that, and they might not be able to articulate um, exactly what they can do or what they might need um, by way of staffing, but what they often can do is define the skills that they need or where they do look for new employers so you can connect, or with employees, so you can connect with them that way. Um, another thing that we've heard from employers is that they don't necessarily want to say because it could, um, in industries where competition is a real thing um, that they, you know, sometimes economic development information is really like top secret, hush hush. Sometimes they don't want to articulate um, what they might be thinking, what they might need for those types of reasons. Um, so again, um, being able to talk in more broad general terms. And I think another point that was made earlier that I would echo is that even businesses within the, within the same sector don't always need the same things or the same type of assistance, um, but to the extent that we can kind of get a sense and maybe, you know, have cohorts of employers that need the same types of skills, particularly basic skills, um, that might be an opportunity to, to get people together. Um, let's see, what else you're going to say, what else I was going to say. Um, I think just generally my main point is that these employers are folks who are already engaged with the system, um, and so it's kind of a safe place to start when you're um, starting to learn how to talk to employers and identifying what their needs are. Um, a lot of actually what I was going to say, Emily and Amy covered, so mm -hmm. I think that, um, that we're all kind of on the same page in regard to, you know, really being able to speak their language, and um, we find in the workforce that System too, of course, like acronyms and talking about programs isn't helpful necessarily, but putting it in terms of what can actually be offered and how you can assist. Um, I think one other thing I would mention is particularly when we're talking about low wage, low skilled workers, um, you know, some employers might say, well, that's not what we need or that's not what we have. Um, helping them think about, well, what if we train like your middle level workers and that opens up new positions and how can we kind of help you along that thinking a bit more as a pathway, which of course is what all of us are trying to do under WIOA. Um, helping them think a little bit about, as Emily was mentioning, what kind of training they actually do or what they might need and how you can play a part in that. So it's not always just like who's someone that we can help you plug in tomorrow for your entry level positions, but thinking of it more holistically is also sometimes helpful. Really, really, well, wow, that that final comment was some new, um, those are some new thoughts for me, really helpful, Anne. Thank you so much for condensing all of that uh, mm -hmm. in a brief bit. 
um, for the cohort participants, uh, again, in webinar materials and in Schoology, we've got a, a link to the Minnesota Workforce Council Association website. They really do have a lot of great resources and has built that up over the years. Um, and then uh, for all of the presenters today outside of the cohort, I created a webinar presenter list that includes contact information for each of our presenters. So thank you, Anne. And we're gonna move on then to another place where we have employers already in the room. This is particularly relevant to those of you who have a partner in an adult career pathway um, in the post-secondary system of the community and technical colleges. Uh, we're really happy today to have Deborah wilcox Shu, Associate System Director of Career and Technical Education at Minnesota State. Uh, she has been around the state in the last couple of weeks. She actually met a few of you at one of the regional events. And Deborah, I'm going to pass it on to you. I have just this one slide. Uh, and we, if you like, can simply um, skip this one and go right into your first slide. Just let me know. And she is on Susan's computer. You are unmuted. Okay, thanks, Liz. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here from Minnesota State System Office and um, wanted to spend some time talking about advisory committees that um, are required by law and by policy um, for all career technical education programs, both at secondary and post-secondary. And um, I spoke with Julie Dinkow and Liz, and we've talked about um, ways that you as ABE managers um, could be involved with some of those advisory committees and what some of the benefits would be to you um, and what the benefits would be to the colleges and the schools, as well as for the employers. Um, okay, let's see. Let's go to the next one. There we go. Oh, before we go any farther, I just want to let you know that we started celebrating CTE month, which uh, started February 1st. The whole month of February is considered Career Technical Education Month. It's being celebrated all around the United States. Uh, and our governor, Mark Dayton, uh, signed a proclamation um, making it official. So it is CTE month. And so this is one of my very first speaking engagements during CTE month. So thank you for joining today. And I hope you help us with that celebration. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, advisory committees are required. Uh, for all career technical education programs, both at secondary, by statute at secondary, and by Minnesota State Board policy. Uh, so we're not doing advisory committees for our CT programs just because it's a good idea, although that is a good idea. Uh, we are doing it because it is required as well. Um, and then we also have some requirements about who must serve on our advisory committees. Um, and those must be employers. And the range that is recommended is between 50 and 75% should be members from business and industry on the advisory committee. Um, MDE requires 50%. Minnesota State gives the range of 50 to 75%. Um, we also have students that serve on our advisory committees faculty and teachers from secondary. We are encouraging because of some of what Ann talked about, employer fatigue um, in our communities. We have secondary CTE folks going to the businesses, wanting them to serve on advisory committees. And we have high school, or I mean colleges going and asking um, businesses to serve on their advisory committee. And there just aren't enough business people to go around to serve on all these committees. And now we realize that ABE folks also um, need to have contact with, with business and industry. And so um, I'm proposing that, and I've been doing, started doing this last week at, our, at an employer engagement event that we have, that um, ABE managers do serve on advisory committees 
for CTE programs where you already have a connection or you're working on um, some kind of a bridge program for one of the CTE programs that are offered in our colleges. Um, in fact, we had a, an employer engagement event last week at Central Lakes College, and we had a couple of ABE managers who came to that event on employer engagement, and in the room were secondary educators, post-secondary educators, workforce development folks, um, Department of Labor and Industry folks. Let's see, who am I missing? We had a broad range of people who are all involved and business and industry representatives who all, and our primary topic was advisory committees and how to have an effective advisory committees because there are advisory committees and then there are advisory committees. So um, we're really working on improving the uh, effect and the outcomes of our advisory committee work. We also have uh, community-based organizations, uh, government agencies, workforce development centers, parents, um, other community alumni sometimes who serve on the advisory committees for our CTE programs. The thing that we're looking for is um, knowledge and skills that are relevant to a CTE program and that could help improve the quality of our CTE programming, make sure that we're current. So the current role for advisory boards, the number one thing on this list is program relevance. So do we have, are we teaching the competencies that are needed? Do we have the appropriate equipment? Are faculty uh, trained in what they need to be trained in? Um, and along with that, the advisory boards help us to assess the quality of our programming. If there are things that are missing or if we're behind the times, um, they're helping us stay current and make sure that we are providing quality programming. They can, uh, the advisory boards help us with all different kinds of problem solving um, from recruitment to placement uh, to providing uh, work uh, experiential learning opportunities, which I know is one of the um, one of the reasons that ABE managers might be interested in being part of our advisory committees at um, in education, um, and and that is providing opportunities for students and staff for experiential learning opportunities. So we're looking at companies that might donate a piece of equipment, and this just happened at the employer engagement meeting I was at last week, there's a big company that donated some really wonderful equipment to keep the program that that feeds them employees current. And then they provided professional development for the secondary teacher and the post-secondary faculty in the CTE program um, to make sure that the, the faculty also know what's going on. And then, um, they can provide advocacy with other employers uh, for us or in the community, uh, help with recruitment of students for the training programs, that sort of thing. So one of the things that uh, we're working on, which hasn't necessarily been part of the role of advisory committees, but needs to be now, we are proposing that we're going to broaden the role of advisory committees that to address the skills gap uh, by advocating strategies to recruit, train, and employ underrepresented groups. And some of those unrepresented groups would include some of the clients or the, the students that you are working with in ABE. And so, um, the belief that I have and my colleagues share is that it's ABE managers' participation is essential to achieving the goal of addressing the skills gap by um, providing opportunities for adults who may not have graduated from high school, who may have English, maybe English language learners, maybe underemployed or unemployed, all of those factors and um, your participation can help us address some of those issues in the advisory committees. One of the things that uh, we have done is write an advisory committee handbook 
um, for all CTE programs across the state, and this is being used as secondary and a post-secondary. And the authors of this book included secondary CTE educators, post-secondary CTE educators, business and industry representatives as well. Um, and I invite you to go take a look at this. It's free, you can download it, you can print it, and it gives um, some really, really good pointers about uh, what you need to do and have in place in order for your advisory committee to be really effective. Um, so in this manual, we, we give you a structure roles of different members, the bylaws, um, the uh, whole strategy for recruiting members. Um, and you'll see at the bottom of that we have sample forms. So we give you sample bylaws. We give you sample letters that you could write to invite someone to serve on advisory committee. We give you samples of agendas. Um, we have over the years, advisory committees, some are really, really good and very effective, and some are not very good and not very effective. And so we are working really hard to make sure that um, these advisory committees are really worth it for everybody involved. So one of the big complaints I've heard from employers is they go to these meetings and there's they get there and there's no agenda, and they sit and listen while the teacher, the faculty member stands up and gives a report, they feed them some good food and then they send them away. And what we're trying to do is make these truly advisory committees. So the employers are involved in, in running the meeting, in creating the agenda. In many cases, it's a, it's a co-leader situation where the faculty member and a business and industry member are co-chairs of the advisory uh, advisory board. And then um, when the business and industry folks speak and talk about what, what things are new that need to be incorporated, the next time they come back, those things have been incorporated. So when they're, they're giving advice, they're being listened to and things are being incorporated into the training program. So now we're on uh, benefits for students and educators. Again, we're looking at programs that are relevant, current, um, high quality, and we're working on keeping the teachers current and advisory committees can help with that. We're developing advocates for CTE education in our employers, uh, tapping into their expertise, and that means really listening to them and implementing the recommendations that they make for our programs. It also gives us an opportunity as educators to really ask, well, what if, to think big, to think about um, what could we be doing for our program or in our programs that would make them even more valuable to employers, even more valuable to students, um, and just really uh, dream about what's possible and what's coming up in a certain discipline. Okay. And of course, we're looking for experiential learning opportunities for both students and educators. And I know that's something you're thinking about too. And what else do we have there? Overall, building a stronger community. Uh, one of the folks that I work with um, from MDE who talks about advisory committees and was part of writing this book, talks about CTE belonging to the community. Because what we're doing is training citizens who will stay in the community, who will make a living wage, have a high quality of life, uh, and be able to really contribute to the economy of the community. And the benefits to business and industry, um, the first thing that they're interested in is um, getting their immediate workforce needs taken care of. And some of the work that they're gonna be doing in an advisory committee really is gonna be working on building the pipeline for the future workforce, um, and thereby building a stronger community. And it also provides networking opportunities for business and industries, although Ann talked about 
Sometimes there's some reticence there because they don't want to share too much because <laughs> they're in competition. So there's always that balance between having really good business contacts and also, you know, being aware of um, their own needs uh, to be competitive as well. But the relationships are key for the businesses as well. And then um, giving back to the community, giving back to the college or the high school. I was at this employer engagement event last week at Central Lakes College, and one of the people who came from Olander and Construction, I think I got that right, is a former, is a graduate of um, the Brainerd High School CTE programs and the Central Lakes Heavy Equipment Program who now is an employer and has moved up in his organization and serves on the advisory board. And he's giving back. He's giving back to his, his high school, giving back to the college that put him, gave him the training and now he's making a really good living. Um, and he's giving back to the students and the community at large. So there's a real sense of accomplishment and um, satisfaction for many folks that serve on these. Great, and um, Anne is, ex uh, um, sorry, Deb is extending an invitation to us to these two um, upcoming employer engagement events. They're regional, and uh, uh, she has the registration link here, and I also have posted the flyer that has uh, all of this information on it. So thank you so much, Deb. We hope that some of us will meet you face to face. And Deb has provided her contact information. Um, I look forward to seeing more, uh, more ABE managers come to those events. Um, they were really good uh, contributors. Great. We had one question that we just want to um, pull up real quick, Astrid. Yes, so we have a participant asking how they might find out who is on their current CT advisory committee at their local community college. Yes. Um, one, there are a couple of different places you can go. The, for the place I would start would be with the, if there's a dean of career technical education at the college, that's a good place to start. Um, sometimes the deans at the college um, divide up the disciplines and so you could find out, for example, if you were um, doing some preparation or some bridge work in manufacturing, um, you could find out which dean at the, at the college uh, works with that particular discipline. Go to them, tell them that you're interested in serving on an advisory committee. Um, and one thing I will mention is that these advisory committees are all based on relationship and the faculty members work really hard to build relationships with their, um, with their businesses and industries. So as a new member on an advisory committee, I would recommend that you start out taking a low profile. Um, I'd recommend that you maybe don't, don't go to the faculty member and say, hey, can I contact all the employers on here and see I can set up experiential learning opportunities for my students. That might not be very well received. Um, however, if you start going to it and you build relationship with the faculty and you'll meet the employers and the issue of experiential learning might be something that you could ask the chairs that they could add to the agenda and discuss it kind of in general for um, both ABE students and high school students and college students. Um, that's a kind of, so it's kind of a relationship, finessing the relationships in an advisory committee. I think that's really, uh, really, really helpful. Thank you so much, Deb. Uh, you have her contact information now. So any of you who, you know, even want a little bit more uh, direct, you know, who might I talk to at the school? Um, Deb really is our contact in CTE. Thank you so much, Deb. And now we get to move on to, um, to employers who are joining us, both from Leech Lake Gaming. These are partners of Laura, 
uh, Malat in our um, cohort. Thank you so much, Laura, for making this contact. Michael Cornezos is Employee Development Training Specialist and Andrea is, uh, or Angie Lundgren is Employee Development Director at Leech Lake Gaming in Cass Lake. And I've just asked them to spend a few minutes, um, it's really what uh, we were all talking about. Let's ask employers, uh, why do you partner? How do you benefit? And um, what advice do you have to us as educators for best partnering with you? So Michael and An Angie, thank you. And they're both on the same uh, computer. Sorry, I will, I'm not very good at doing this and unmuting you at the same time. And good afternoon. Thanks for inviting us today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, so the question was, why have you chosen a partner with the ABE? Um, for Leech Light Gaming, um, we formerly used the ABE program for our GED incentive program. Leech Light Gaming would reimburse for any costs associated with our employees um, attaining their GED. It is the policy of Leech Light Gaming to encourage all employees to develop their, skill, develop their skills and education through a variety of training programs and college courses that have a direct impact on the employee's career path and the success of Leech Light Gaming Division. Um, partnering with Laura and the ABE program here um, has given us the opportunity to assess our upper and mid-level management team's strengths and weaknesses which was deemed mission critical. Um, this allowed us to identify areas that were in need of improvement. This partnership allowed us to plan and implement future trainings for the respective departments. It also helped with um, employee placement. Great, so <laughs> pretty concrete um, ways that it immediately impacts your uh, employment needs there. Thank Absolutely. You. Um, what needs do you have in as, a, as an employer that can be addressed by your local adult career pathway program? And what are the benefits? Um, well, at Leech Lake Gaming, we understand that many of our employees have never been exposed to nor offered the opportunity for a higher education. Today, Leech Lake Gaming employs about 1,150 employees. We offer full-time, part-time positions, seasonal, temporary. It is our policy that if an employee is registered at the Leech Lake Tribal College or other technical undergraduate or graduate educational institution, they may arrange with his or her manager to adjust his or her work schedule around classes. It's also, also our policy that employees will be allowed to attend any on-site adult basic education class during their work schedule with pay if approved by the employee's manager director for up to four credits or four hours each week. Um, although Leech Site Gaming offers a wide variety of trainings internally, we've utilized Laura and her program for such things as basic computer skills, reading, math, and grammar refreshers. Um, we plan on continuing our partnership with her for many years to come, hopefully. In doing so, we believe it will only strengthen our workforce and, and help us with uh, future employee placement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Michael, did you have some um, comments to add? Um, not really. We actually kind of that's great kinda got together and, and wrote down what we wanted to. to Perfect. Prove. Can you tell I'm reading it right off? Of <laughs> that's okay. It's nice to have some uh, prepared comments and so advice to us. And again, we said you know an employer can't quote represent all employers, but just any advice to us about how to best partner when we as educators are coming to you um, to ask you to be involved? Well, I guess um, we're located right in the heart of the Leech Lake Reservation. So, uh, you know, of our 1,150 employees, 51% of them are enrolled with Leech Lake. Uh -huh. uh, near, nearly 10% are enrolled with other bands across the country and 38.3% are non-native. So although we offer many career opportunities within our organization, anything from custodial to mechanical, boiler operator, CPO, bartenders to cooks, hospitality to marketing, 
accounting and table games, administrative to medical careers. Um, we also have an electrical apprentice program, so you can see there's a w wide variety. And we face the same barriers as most employers in this area. That includes substance abuse, transportation, education levels, child care. Um, and now we're looking at uh, possibly 100 more positions for the summer of 2019 for Leech Lake Gaming. Um, we're building a new Palace Casino here in Cass Lake, so, you know, we do appreciate um, Given that being given the opportunity to, you know, find that workforce out there, the jobs are there for us. We just need help filling them. Great. So we really just need to show up as partners and figure out how uh, education and training can um, really equip people with the set of needs uh, that you've got in those uh, with that employment gap. Yep, Laura and I will often have little brainstorming sessions mm -hmm. about possible potential classes that we can come up with. And um, we also work with some of our other, um, you know, I've gone through Optivation, um, BSU, NWOIC in Bemidji, Bemidji Workforce Center. And if there's ever a time that we can, you know, have a space available for them to use um, with their, their, adult basic education we offer that up as well so we're just Great. working together so, mm -hmm. well thank you i'm sure we could uh, learn much more from you we are going to move on because we want an opportunity for our participants to talk with one another about what they've heard today again thank you to all four of our guest presenters as well as amy and emily uh, our guests, uh, you can now sign off. We say farewell. And again, uh, so much appreciate your input today. And we're going to be sending our cohort participants into small groups. So thank, thank you, you so much. All right. So um, sector group discussion. Astrid is going to uh, go through this. Uh, with you. Uh, this is an experiment. So thank you very much for uh, stepping into um, this opportunity to talk to one another briefly during the webinar. Astrid. Yes, so um, we are going to just give you a little bit of logistical information about how this is going to work. So Liz, um, in a moment here, is going to... Sorry, I just muted you by... by... Accident. Go ahead. Sorry, after I just muted you yes. by accident. No problem. <laughs> Technical Liz. difficulties. I have so much power. All right, you are all unmuted now because I want to make sure that you're unmuted when you go into your session. Thank you. Yes. So you'll want to mute yourself on your end if you haven't done that already. Liz is going to be putting you into breakout groups based on your sectors. Um, at that point, you will have audio only, so you want to make sure to unmute yourself. You'll see a chat bar on the right hand side. So you can chat to either your entire small group or one person. Uh, you can, um, if you need some help, you can raise your hand using that hand icon and uh, Liz will be able to chat with you to, to help you out with any issues you're having. And if for any reason your audio isn't working, you can use the, the chat box and you'll see a list of all of the others in your group on the screen. So Liz has already coordinated with folks ahead of time and identified a facilitator and note taker for each small group. Um, we're asking that you start with a roll call um, so everyone can make sure that their audio is working. Uh, say your name and just make sure that everyone can be heard. As Liz mentioned, both in Schoology and in our materials, um, you were given a webinar note taking sheet. So we'd encourage you to use that as a guide um, and you can be thinking about which of those questions um, really stands out to you as one you'd like to talk to with your sector group. I want to make sure that everyone does get a chance to speak. This is a unique opportunity to connect uh, real time with your cohort colleagues um, and just move on, move beyond just discussing problems to a really productive conversation. And then we're asking note takers at the end of your small group discussion to choose one idea from the discussion to share back uh, with the rest of the groups um, with a one minute report back.
And then at 3.20, uh, your small group will automatically uh, be closed and you'll be called back into our large group session. And, so because as we're just, and we're running just a little bit behind, so I'm just going to bump that to about 3.23. Okay, great. Thanks, Liz. So as a reminder, these are our groups. Um, they are the same ones that you worked with um, when we met face-to-face -face at Summer Institute in St. Cloud. So again, these are the discussion questions we'll be using to guide your small groups today. These are all on your note-taking sheet. Um, Liz will be looking for raised hands and will attempt to address any issues. And then Susan Wettenkamp Brandt is available by email. If you're having any tech issues, she can try to troubleshoot those. So as Liz is finalizing um, the transition to our groups, just encourage you to take a look at these discussion questions, gather your thoughts and think about which one or ones you want to focus on with the group. Hello. <clears throat> Can anybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, are we, yep. just, hi, just are we in our subgroups yet? No. Oh. Hi, it's Kelly. Hi. Can you hear me? Just wait, please. I'm setting up the small groups and then they will start in just a moment. Thank you. Right. And you'll see that your screen will change. And I do notice there are a handful of you who have joined via phone, Betsy and Brent. Oh, Brent, uh, uh, looks like you yep. also have a computer connection. Um, but Betsy, you will need to call in separately to your small group. Okay. And will I get instructions? That's what we understand, yes. Okay. Thank you. This is uh, the... Sorry. I'm... Karen, you can go into the materials section of this webinar now and download that note-taking sheet. Um, so other organizers, it is extremely slow and um, cumbersome to move people around in breakouts. I'm inclined to start the breakout with the random groupings. Let's do that. Okay. Uh, so participants, I apologize. I knew that this was going to be a challenge, but I hadn't been able to test it. And the uh, breakout function puts you into randomized groups, and I wanted you into sector groups. I'm just going to put you into your randomized groups. And I wish you a very good um, 15, 16 minute discussion. Um, and that's going to start now.
Sure. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi. We're back. Hello. Are we done? Okay, that's the power of the organizer. I just stopped all of you and invited you back. Um, again, thank you so much for your willingness to um, participate. Um, tech problems, I'll have you give feedback on all of that in uh, the evaluation. I would definitely give more time. Again, as always, the parts before the breakouts um, edged out a little bit of our time together. But thank you for a thoughtful conversation with each other. I appreciate it. Um, and um, let's have, uh, so our original note takers got all mixed up. Um, but let's go ahead and I'm just gonna uh, get us back here. Oops. Okay, and I'm just going to make sure that my screen is back on. And Astrid, you can um, help us with a real quick uh, report back. Well, since we um, did not have uh, our original note takers, I'm going to ask folks to chat in who will be sharing from each group. Um, and let's start with um, Julie from Breakout D. I will unmute you, Julie. Go ahead, Julie. Okay, hi. Um, and, and, really just, and really just one minute, like real quick uh, yep. something. Okay, Thank you. two things. Just remember on workforce development boards that there are subcommittees that can tackle individual things. Like there, was, one of the subcommittees is working with um, previously incarcerated adults. And um, that was one suggestion. And another one was just working with um, the CTE people on, on the uh, advisory groups or the advisory panels for uh, Minnesota State Colleges. Thanks, Julie. Yep. Yeah. Let's move on to Teresa. And I think that is your unmuted Hi. Teresa. Hi everyone. Yeah. And I went ahead and put since I was supposed to do business sector, I typed my notes into business sector, That's even great. though we Thank weren't you. business sector. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So one thing that our, our group talked about was with the local workforce development boards was kind of latching onto that idea. We had a rep in the group who said, um, trying to follow up on that idea of getting the board more engaged with this, because the board currently isn't, um, and trying to get maybe a, a regional employer committee set up through those auspices, or at least looking into that. Um, another thing we did more discussion about what Emily had been talking about with the, um, uh, in trying to get beyond employers saying they want a specific high school credential, but rather what are the underlying skill sets that they're looking for and just trying to uh, hone in on that. Um, I think those are probably the main takeaways that I got notes on. Great. Thank you, Teresa. Mm -hmm. Let's go on then to Amy. I will unmute you, Amy. Go ahead, Amy. Okay, and I think ours were very similar to what everybody else was talking about, business language versus education language when you're talking to employers. Um, really try to find out what is the benefit to the employer, what are the employer's goals and what do they want um, from ACP programming. Um, skills, as they said in the last commenter, needed versus high school diploma and maybe both eventually, but a focus on skills first. And then, Employers are often open to in informational interviews, but try not to open your, um, first getting them, you know, when you're first onboarding an employer into an ACP um, structure, or program, or possibility, maybe not overwhelm them with a whole bunch of questions and meetings. And then um, you might find yourself in a train the trainer um, situation where you need to help the employer understand the time involved to get the employee through a GED program and maybe 
helping, you know, just like training the employer about how, what their, their employee's current set of skills is. I can't remember, I think it was Karen or Tammy that talked about, that talked about the employer um, wanted all their employees to have a GED and then what they really wanted was just that they needed their employees to have a higher reading and writing skill set. I think that's what Karen was saying. And so then um, through the comp the dialogue between the ABE and the employer, they realized there was lots they could do with that before a GED. And then um, Tammy you, talked about... Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're just going to move on. Yeah. And Scott Hall had made that same comment in the chat earlier. So really helpful. Thank you. I just want to make sure that I let you guys go on time. Thank you. Wow. Lots of stuff in a short period of time. Astrid, I'll let you take it over again. Thank you. Okay. And then, uh, Ron, I'll unmute you and you take just a minute to share an idea. Awesome. Uh, I was not supposed to be taking notes, so you're going to have to go off the top of my head. But three things came up. One, they really very much appreciated the training that we had today. Two, the timing of it was right in our relationships that we're having going currently. And finally, it really all revolves around the relationships that we make with each other and each of the different people in each of the sectors. Great. Thanks, Ron. Is that everybody? Yep. We'll turn it back to you, Liz. All right. For wrap up. Um, I think Ron's uh, was a good summing up. So thank you. It sounds like most of you uh, took something away both from today and are just really in the in the thick of things with employer engagement in your real world context. So thank you. Um, and uh, an evaluation will pop up immediately as we um, sign off today. The nicest is if you just take five minutes and do that evaluation right away. It will also come in a follow-up email. Um, especially important will be <laughs> feedback on these breakouts um, and for sure finish that evaluation by February 9 and that is an expectation of cohort participation. Your feedback is just really essential, especially as this is a pilot. Um, the webinar recording and the chat log will get posted in Schoology this week once those are available. As I noted, discussion number eight is up now, uh, a place to continue discussion. If there were things that got started in your small group that really didn't get finished, uh, go there. And then assignment 8B went out in uh, Schoology update last week. Uh, we're pretty excited about that work. Uh, it will look familiar to you. It's the um, sort of more tools and then setting your own SMART goal and action plan. We're giving you plenty of time to work on that due March 9. And then this is new information. It will go out in the Schoology update um, in the next couple of weeks. Next check-in calls will be April 9, 10, 16, and 17. And uh, it'll be tricky because we're going to need to do it remotely in terms of sign up and you have to sign up with your partner. So I will post that schedule um, fairly soon, I think, to get that on people's calendars and give you time to um, confer with your partner on signing up together. And then I also will be um, inviting input via a Schoology discussion to the May wrap-up workshop. So really be thinking um, about what you would like to see happen in that workshop and we will be shaping it. We've got some ideas, but really want to shape it to serve you as um, the hardworking cohort participants that you are. And I know that you're going to be very eager to be back face to face. Uh, any final questions? I'll just have you do those offline, either by email to me or in Schoology. And we wish you good luck in your ongoing Adult Career Pathway efforts. Thank you so much, and we're signing off.
Scott, Brent, and Amy, can you sign off, please? Thank you. Excellent. And if you have any questions, Brent, if they, oh, Brent, if can you sign off? Any troubles with that, or if they're not, uh, if there's any issues with that, just let us know because what most people end up doing is even if they might qualify under one of the others, they might end up say, uh, choosing um, option six or condition six because that is the one that is. Uh, Julie, you're, oh, sorry. Okay, I've mu muted Julie. Amy, can you sign off, please? Thank you. All right, here we are. I've muted Julie just because Brad's voice is in the background. Everybody else is unmuted. Um, I've got, hi. hi. Good job, Liz. 